sample data. Uh, section 1.4, uh, we have two types of data that we collect. We do observations. And we have experiments. For the observational studies, we do nothing. Technically, all we do is we collect the data, but the, the difference is with an experiment, we actually do something. We have some type of treatment. But when we do an observational study, we do nothing. We observe. We collect data. May I'll see that? There we go. So observational study, we do nothing. We observe. We collect data. Any questions on that so far? versus an experiment, we do something. Specifically, we give a treatment. I like the way the book puts this. They put a little scary word in there. but We induce some treatment. It's just a great use of that word. We induce some treatment. And we measure results. See, an observation would be more like if I sent out a poll across the classroom and I asked you what your opinion was on something. Or if I just, I could even just collect what's, what's the height, the average height of the students in this class. No, I just defended somebody. We're going to have lots of hot topics. Uh, but, and, and I just had you write down self-report. I collect that data. I don't actually go around and measure it. You see what I'm saying? Versus an experiment would be, you know, here I want to test if this medicine helps something grow. And so I give it that medicine. Are you hearing something like that? Oh, you're doing a roll sheet. Thank you. Uh, I actually give something the medicine and then I measure the change in growth. Does that make sense? So we do something. We do a treatment and we measure those results at the end. The key on this is when we do observational studies, we get correlation. And correlation literally is meaning is built into the, what the word is written as. Co, together, relate. It's how things relate to each other. Correlation. You look at something and say, you know, I could find some correlation probably between a person's weight, they told you that some people, and their speed. You think there's a relationship between a person's weight and how fast they can run? Right? Maybe? What do you think, hypothetically, if a person were to weigh... Pick a, pick, pick a size, I don't care. Well, not a number, but like a, a descriptor, more or less. Pick one. If a person were to weigh more, they might run slower. We might be able to find a correlation between that. Does that mean it's always true? No, you go measure some football players, right? They weigh a freaking ton and they run fast so it's not necessarily cause and effect it's just you're like there's some relationship between these two things right but it doesn't mean cause and effect in fact we say correlation is not causation versus experiments because I do that treatment I do this thing to specifically measure the result then I go, you know what, I, I, I did this and the plant grew. I did this, the blood pressure went down. I did this, and you get a cause and effect. Does that make sense? So this gives us cause, I'll learn to spell cause someday, and effect. You can actually have a measurable result, and we say giving this medicine has this result. Okay? This observational study, I, I told you before in the earlier lecture that Statistics is a class that should change your perspective on things. Because I'll tell you right now, people use observational studies all the time to draw cause and effect, and it's a damn lie. All the time. And we're talking, we make sweeping educational decisions, we make decisions across where to fund things, and we do it via observational studies. Uh, a couple of my favorite examples when I was growing up, uh, we used to talk about, they said they actually had an observational study, they had people and they asked them, do you live under electric wires? And they found that people that lived under electric wires, on average, scored lower on a test. 
and people started freaking out, going, oh, the electric wires are shooting some waves down that are affecting their brains and making them less intelligent. Uh, no joke, this is what people thought. These people were worried about this, right? Okay. Do you think the electric wires did that? Where do you tend to see electric wires? What parts of town? I didn't hear you because I'm old. What'd you say? Rural? Or like outside of the town, right? So when I grew up, where I started living, you know, like Northeast Bakersfield, we had these electric wires. We'd live in the apartments, there were wires all around there, right? And then as I grew up, I started buying the houses that were in kind of the newer parts of town. Do you see a lot of electric wires in newer parts of town? Where'd they go? Do you think they buried them because they're afraid of the, the waves coming down and making you stupid? No. But the idea is what? They, as the newer parts of town, they said, you know what, these wires hanging up, it's really a liability. We have to maintain them. If wind comes and blows them over, it's worth it just to bury them. And they're easier to access, they're easier to maintain, right? So, so now we're saying, okay, so a newer part of town versus an older part of town, why do you think those people were scoring lower on tests? What's that again? So maybe they don't have a, a, as a great accessibility to certain schools, right? A lot of times the older part of towns are where you find people that are poor. So you're saying poor people are stupid. No, right? But there's a correlation. You say, well, the correlation is the poor people don't score as well on the test. Why, though? Maybe they don't have access to as many opportunities. And so we start looking into this, and this is important. Like I said, I'm not trying to offend anyone. What we do is we look into that and we go, you know what we should do is we should redirect money to give these people more opportunities and, and see if we can help them, right? So, And that's important. So we don't draw causation from correlation. Make sense? Okay. All right. Off my soapbox. Wait, wait, there's one more. Okay. This one, this one's another personal one. Just a, a, I've got a family member, and she's got a... a bachelor's degree and sometimes she's just dumb as a rock and she just says she goes one day I heard her just announce this out like a fact she goes you know you know when it's colder people tend to get sick so therefore if it's cold that causes you to get sick is that true any science majors in here what causes you to get sick bacteria germs right does the cold weather cause you to get sick no now, what happens is, what the correlation, we can look into maybe other factors and you say, well, when it's colder, we tend to spend more time inside, closer to other people, and it's a lot easier to spread those diseases. But does the cold weather cause you to get sick? Now, the cold weather could lower your immunities, which could then help. So I understand all that, but the cold weather doesn't cause you to catch a cold. Make sense? All right, enough of that. I've got more examples, but just listen to the news. You'll hear them all the time. Uh, this to me, sorry, I'm going to get that back on the screen. Uh, this to me is a bee basket issue. This is something, there will probably be maybe a couple questions where they ask you this type of thing in the homework. This is not on the test. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, cross-sectional is basically where I take and we compare groups. We compare across groups. Retrospective literally is where I look into the, what is it? The past. So we look at past data. And prospective is where we look We're in kind of like future data. So we look forward, we look, I'm sorry about that glare, it's horrible. But we look forward, we look into the future data, and we can try to draw some conclusions to compare there. Okay? Um, what else? We're almost there. And, oh, by the way, these are not my notes. So there's going to be some things, like when we get to the end of this section, you're going to need a separate piece of paper. There's things I like to add to it that I, I, I believe are important. Okay? The reason I like these is because they outline some really good stuff. It makes it easier for you to take notes. And uh, secondly, the, the lady that I borrowed, begged, borrowed, and stole this from um, has really good examples. 
And so I, I found that when we get through the notes faster, we can spend more time doing examples and people seem happier about that, okay? So just know that they're, they're not exactly my notes, so I do modify them kind of as we go. All right, with an experiment, we try to control the effects of the variables. We do what's called the placebo effect. The placebo effect is basically where we give a fake treatment. Why would we give a, a fake treatment? Okay. The idea is a lot of times, and they found this, right, when they're testing a medicine, and I, I'll just go, if you have this cancer and they're giving you a medicine and they give you the medicine and then they measure and go, wow, this person has improved. They have less cells, less reporting. This is successful, right? But then they would take that same person and give them a sugar pill, like a, literally a pill full of sugar. And they took that pill and they saw the same results. Why? The power of the mind. That's why we say if you're sick or if you're in those such situations, you have that positive energy because it can actually have an impact. There's a lot of research to back that up. In fact, so much that when we run experiments, we give a fake treatment because people that are thinking they're going to get better, a lot of times they improve. Does that make sense? So we have some fake treatment um, so that we can measure the, that what's happening is really, really the effect, the cause and effect. Okay. Um, the other thing we do is a double blind experiment. Both the person receiving, receiving, and me crazy. All right, giving the treatment. They don't know. They don't know what if it's real. They don't know if it's real or the fake. Okay, it's important that you're not handing somebody and going, "Here's your sugar pill. How are you doing?" Right? They need to. If the power of the mind, they need to think they're taking the real medicine. Right? Why does it matter that the person giving the treatment? They don't have the ability to do it. Right? We we all have hearts, don't we? If I'm giving you something and I know that it's a sugar pill and you have this disease and I'm measuring the results and it's not proving, it affects the way that I treat you and that kind of hints at it. So we want to control that. We want there to be complete ignorance except for the heartless person on the top that's collecting the data. And But the idea is we need to know whether the treatment is real. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what a double blind. Um, a really good example for this, and I don't remember if it's in this book or another book I've used, but... Um, they did a gastric freezing. Look it up, but don't click the images. It's gross. I'm just kidding. Um, but the idea is that what they found, and this I think was occurring back in the 70s, when they were looking at people that were having the acid reflux and the high acidity, and they're like, man, these people are miserable. And they said, well, I got an idea, right? If you look at the acid, their, their temperature inside their stomach is actually increased because of the acid, what if we were to drop a little balloon into their stomach and fill it with freezing cold liquid and lower the temperature in the stomach? And they said that might reduce the acidity and it might help relieve the pain. It's for like severe acid reflux, right? Mm -hmm. And so they tried it. They took the, the bags and they tested it on people and they found that a significant number of people were actually improving. And they said, this is great. So they started shipping this out to the hospitals and they were trying this on people and they were seeing success. And after about a decade of insurance companies paying this out and thinking, you know, this is a good thing, um, some statistician sat down and said, wait, 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 wait. There was no placebo. And so what they did is they ran the experiment again. And what they did is some people thought they were getting the treatment and some people were put under and never actually received the treatment. And there was not a significant difference in the improvement. That's a big deal. Like, that's an insurance company that's putting out money as people that are having a balloon shoved down into their stomach full of liquid, and it's just as good as being saying, you got the treatment. That's a big deal. That's why we have these things. We want to avoid lawsuits, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is the sampling methods. I'm going to say right now, the book 
does this weird thing where they call, they'll use the term random sampling. Okay. I'm going to argue that all of these, except for the, the bad one, are all types of random sampling. Okay. This convenient sampling, that's, that's the bad one. We'll talk about that in a minute. But the rest of them are a type of random sampling, meaning the people have a chance or opportunity. Everyone has an opportunity to be picked at random, right? Okay. I'm not going to use that term on a test. They use it a little bit in the homework and they differentiate it. Okay. But for instance, I'll have people describe simple random sampling and then they write the word random sampling. That's not correct. Okay. These are all types of random sampling. That's, that's kind of the umbrella. If I'm going to ask you what type of sampling on a test or a quiz, it's going to be simple random, systematic, stratified, or clustered. Okay? So don't, don't be confused by the homework with that, please. It's okay to really differentiate some things. But So what does simple random sampling do? Here's where we number the entire population. And we choose individuals at random. And when I say we choose, does that mean I literally go out and pick that person? No. How do we choose those people? Exactly. Some form of technology is what we normally do, a random number generator. Your calculator has it built in. You could you could sit there and randomly choose people with your calculator. Okay? It has but what did we do before we had these calculators? I think this is interesting. What was it? Um, that's actually we'll talk about that in a minute. No, that well they did that sometimes, but that ended up being bad. Um, no, we they have uh, books full of random numbers. You know, that's bizarre. somebody's like, that's BS. Like how do they know they're random? But I'm telling you. There's a whole field of mathematics on randomness and how every number every number has an equal chance of showing up. And um, one of my professors, he had talked about when he was going and getting his PhD in statistics, and his he had a whole course on randomness. And what his professor recommended, he said, "Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk out of the room for 20 minutes. I'm going to pick, you know, every student is going to write down a list of um, I don't know 15 numbers, okay." And he said, and I'm going to have five of you write down um, those numbers from the book, from this book of random digits. The rest of you just pick, as random as you can. And he left, and he came back in, and he and literally just could look at every paper and go, real, fake, real, fake, real, fake. These people, they, there's a difference. You think you're being random, right? Even if you close your eyes and stab at a, a piece of paper, you favor one side over the other. There's, there's just, we can't do it. We introduce bias whenever we do something, okay? So I'll leave it at that. Uh, as far as pulling paper, that's an interesting story because they did, um, back in the World Wars, they were drafting people, right? And they actually drafted people by pulling names. What they did is they took all the eligible people to go to war, they had a slip of paper with their name on it, and they stuck it in this big thing, shook it up, okay? And so they got all the names from people from January and stuck them in there and shook it up. Everybody from February then shook it up, and everyone in March, and, shook, and so on and so forth, until they had all the names in there, shook it up, and then they pulled out names, right? And they thought, this is random. We're not just picking. We're not just, this will be random. And then there was a study done later on, and there was a, a very high probability or a much higher chance of being picked to go to the World Wars if you were born in October, November, December, versus if you were born in January, February, March. There's a significant difference between them. They said, well, what happened? They said, well, what did we do? We put all the names in for January, shook them, February, shook them, March, shook them. And when, at the very end, they put in November, December. And so those were the names that were put in last and got shaken up the least. And so if you were born in October, November, December, you had a higher chance of being sent off to war and dying. Is that okay? Randomness matters. Do you see what I'm saying? Like right now, you're like, well, it doesn't matter. But I'm telling you, we were shipping people off to war to die, and you had a much higher chance if you were born in those later months. That's a big deal. You see why statistics might be important. All right. Systematic sampling. This is where we choose 
every nth person. So I might have my entire list of the population, and I might just say, you know, every 15th person on the list, the 15th person, the 30, the 45, the 60, and just so on, until I make sure I have enough. But I would do every nth person, and they would get chosen. Okay? It's not as ideal, but sometimes it's just kind of easier to do. And as long as, you know, you're getting a good sampling from the entire population, it should still represent the population pretty well. Okay? Be careful with this because, you know, you might skip over like entire groups of names and different nationalities and different. So this is a risky, but, but it is something we do sometimes. Systematically choose every nth person. Does that make sense? Okay. No story with that one. Convenience sampling. Uh, this is bad. This is where we sample in some way convenient to the sampler. And what it does is it creates, to see, it creates bias. A real life example that I saw of this that I just, I found was interesting. One of my first years teaching statistics, I had one of my, one of my students come back to me after learning this chapter and he said, the administrator of the school said, you know what, we're really interested. There's this hot topic, and we want to poll the students and get an opinion and have them be part of the decision making. I was like, that's awesome. He goes, yeah, so what he wanted to do was he wanted to go into the cafeteria and randomly choose people from the cafeteria. Is that going to represent the entire population of the school? Probably not. That's really convenient for him, though, isn't it? And this is a person with a, you know, a PhD and business and all that, but he's like yeah let's just go sample people from the cafeteria who's getting left out if you sample people in the cafeteria not everyone goes into the cafeteria right might they differ in some important way right maybe they don't have money to buy the food maybe they're embarrassed or maybe they, I don't know right maybe they ditched campus maybe they're the ones that are in trouble do we care about their opinion you're like screw them no no we care right with the idea is Maybe they're ditching because they're not happy about some decision and their input might actually help them. We want to know, right? And so my, this student literally raised his hand in the middle of the meeting and said, we should get a list of all the students and randomly pick and try to sample those people. I was like, good job, right? Because you're going to create bias. Some group is potentially left out and their opinion matters. Make sense? Okay, so that's the idea of convenience sampling. Uh, you see this a lot of times online. When people send out polls, you go to a website and they say, what do you think about this? And you got to click and respond. Okay, That's convenient for them to collect. And we'll talk about what bias that creates. Okay, um, Which one? That's, there's voluntary, there's undercover, there's all kinds of biases we'll talk about. But the idea is that this creates bias in the sampling. Make sense? Okay. Uh, where are we at? Stratified. Maybe I can move this. Uh, stratified is where we... We divide the population up by a characteristic of interest. Uh, this can be age, gender, race, height, weight, some category that you think might matter or might have an effect on the result. One, one example I'd come up with um, that I've, I've heard about is where they talk about um, heart medicine. And they want to lower your blood pressure so you don't have a heart attack, right? And so what they did is they were sampling and they were, they were using this heart medicine on the general population and the general population was actually having less heart attacks. And they said, this is awesome. But what they did is, as they did that, they had people write down their ages, their weights, their race. Their... And what they found out was, even though the, the medicine worked really well in the general population, uh, the medicine actually increased the heart attacks in black people. Do you think that matters? See, we're not trying to be biased by collecting this data. We're trying to make sure 
it works, you know. There, there are some differences where things interact differently in our body. We need to know that, okay? Um, gender. I, the professor I had, he was actually doing like a multi-million dollar study, and they had this medicine, and it was effective. And there was this little group that was off that it wasn't effective with. And the other statistician said, ah, oh, it's just a small group. Leave them alone. He's like, mm, let me see. And every, every single person in that little group was a female. He said, wait a second. So what he did is he separated the data by male and female, and the data worked even better for males, but it actually wasn't that effective on females. Does that matter? See, and so you got to keep that track. you got to stratify. You divide them by some characteristic of interest. Make sense? Okay. Uh, cluster sampling is kind of similar. Oh, I'm not done here, actually. Divide the population, and then what we do is we do a um, simple random sample from each group. Group. There we go. If I can scoot this down. Where is it at? There it is. So what, once we've divided them up, we do random sampling from each group, and that way we make sure every group is represented. I'll leave it at that. Cluster sampling. This time the population is grouped, but not by some characteristic. We just have some natural grouping that has already occurred. Okay? So it's not by a special characteristic. Just there's some already some grouping. And what we do is we randomly choose clusters and we sample the entire group. So they're already grouped. And rather than choose individuals, I choose entire groups. And everybody in that group gets sampled. Okay? So we randomly choose... clusters, right, those are our groups, and sample everyone or everything from each group, from the chosen groups. Um, an easy one for this, in my mind, is farming. I think of grapes. Grapes grow in bunches or clusters of grapes, right? If I'm going to if I want to sample my crop of grapes, do I need to go out there and individually number every single grape? Yeah. Utterly ridiculous. They're already grouped together, aren't they? So what you would do is you might randomly choose a row and then randomly choose a bush and then randomly choose uh, what did you call it? Bunch. There you go. I was, I couldn't get cluster out of my mind, so that worked. So but then you what do you only sample one grape from that bunch? No, you sample every single one. So that's the idea. Everyone from that group gets sampled. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on this before we continue? All right. I think I only have one more thing to add to this, and then we're just going to look at some examples. So you should have this in front of you. And this is open discussion, so let's, we'll kind of go through this, but Concerned about the possible relationship between cell phone use and head and neck cancer. That's horrible. Uh, 5,000 subjects are located through the phone company billing records as cell phone owners for at least five years. They are matched by age and sex with 5,000 non-cell phone users from the same community. Subjects are then asked for, permissive to, um, for permission to review the medical records to determine if they have been diagnosed with head or neck cancer in the past five years. What type of observational study is being described? Remember, we had the three types. I have this in here still because it popped up in your homework. This is not on the test. Okay? So we had cross-sectional, cross retrospective, and prospective, right? Retrospective means we're looking at, like, past data, right? Is that what this is saying? Well, that means they've done it for five years, right? But we are looking at their medical records in the past five years. I buy that. That right there implies a retrospective. I like that. Okay. 
think I'm going to leave that. I'm just trying to see if there's anything I'm missing. Man, in statistics, there's all these little tricky things. I'm going to leave that for now, and if I need to come back to it, I will. Are we okay with that? Did we see the idea of looking at past data? Okay. Is this an experiment? Did they do anything? No, they're just collecting data. This is an observation. This is a correlational study. All right. Tricks of me. Concerned about the possible relationship between cell phone use and head and neck cancer. 300 cases of head and neck cancer are identified from six cancer treatment centers around the U.S. An additional set of 300 controls is chosen from hospitals associated with the same centers. Controls were selected among those not being treated for cancer, okay, and they were matched with cases on age, sex, race, occupational category. The number of cell phone users in each group was compared. What are we thinking? What makes you think cross-sectional? The, the minute it said that they were compared. We're comparing one group to the other. That's a you, I don't know if we could make the argument are they collecting, I think they're collecting current data so that's not really retrospective, right? And they're not comparing it to future data, so we're just dealing with two groups being compared to each other. Is that okay? All right, one more. Concerned about possible relationship between cell phone use and head and neck cancer, 10,000 subjects are recruited for a study. All are examined, determined to be cancer-free at the start of the study. 5,000 are, regu um, are regular cell phone users. 5,000 claim to have never have used one. That's weird. And promised not to use one until after the study is completed. Uh, the investigators follow the subjects for five years. We're looking at stuff from the future, right? We're comparing them to themselves in the future that is perspective. All right. Can I keep going? Maybe. There we go. Let's apply these definitions. Is this random, systematic, convenience, stratified, or collective? 10,000 jelly beans are mixed up in a large vat, then one scoop of 100 is taken out as a sample for quality control. Give me a word. Cluster sample says I sample and I choose the entire group. Is that what happened? Did we choose a random group and then compare the entire group? I'm okay with that. I, I'll have some people go, simple random? And then I have to ask the question, did we number every jelly bean? Did every jelly bean get numbered and then randomly chosen? We don't do that. We chose a cluster or a grouping of them, right? It's kind of a weird cluster, but I think um, trying to see if there's anything else. Stratified, it's not like we divided them by some characteristic. Okay, you guys seem ready to move on, so I'll move on. For five wineries, two bottles of wine from each are selected to be in a sample. What are we thinking? Systematic, so we chose every two bottle, every second bottle. That's where we choose every end, right? It's not quite what it's saying, is it? So we're doing a random sampling from each liner. What does that mean? Convenience. You could, might be able to make an argument for that where you're sampling, but I, I think what's more important is that we separated them into five separate wineries or five separate and they might have some difference of importance they produce it differently right and then we do a random sampling from each group what is that that is stratified Table set up in a mall, and the first hundred people who walk by are asked to fill out a survey. They will be in the sample. 
There's our cafeteria again, right? It's very easy to do that, but that's not going to represent everybody, right? I don't know the last time I was in the mall in Bakersfield. I don't know. Maybe once a year. Okay? I'm not going to be, I'm going to be left out of that survey. And they may want, they may care about my opinion. I hope they do. So you said convenience. Using various zip codes in Porterville, all the people living in the 93257 area are chosen to be in the sample. Systematic is where I choose every nth person. What? Cluster is where I choose a random group and I sample everyone from that group. Is that what we did? You could, if you're going to make an argument, well, stratified is where I sample from every zip code, a small group, right? But the idea is, aren't the people in Porterville lumped into groups by zip code? And if I choose one group and I sample everyone from that, right, that would, that would be a cluster. And I know somebody already said that. I just wanted you all to keep thinking. It's kind of a weird one, but I wanted you to see that. Um, do you think that the people living in that zip code would represent all of Porterville? And that's fine. That's a different argument. And I could ask you that and say, in this cluster sampling, there would be bias because certain groups would be left out. We might have under coverage. We might have, that's good. It's good discussion to have, okay? But when they're just asking for the sampling method. Uh, for, every, for every even numbered page in the phone book, the fifth phone number belongs to a person who will be in the sample. Every nth person, right? Or systematic. I think we're done with this, right? I want to, and I, I don't know why it's not written in here. It's just, I can't leave this here because to me, when we're talking about the biases, we need to kind of go through some of the biases. And I know these are words I'm going to ask you to know. I can't remember if they're in this section, but I'm going to bring them up. Okay, so this is something I I just can't stand. Where did it go? Eeny, right there. Because as we're talking about these, and I just said, right, I'm going to sample the people from that zip code, and you're all going, that's not going to represent everyone. Right? When you have some group that is left out and they differ in some important way, that is called under coverage. Maybe. Some group is left out. And they differ in some important way. This is why we use things like stratify. We say there's some group that I want to make sure does not get underrepresented. Um, really easy example. I, I don't I don't know, but let's say I was wanting to poll how safe you feel walking back to your car from an 8:30 p.m. class. Mm -hmm. Right? What might be a characteristic of interest? Mm -hmm. Gender. Do you think you might feel more or less secure depending on your gender? Mm -hmm. Now, if you were at a school that it was 80% male and 20% female, and this isn't that type of school, but if you were, right, it's very possible I could randomly choose and go, most of the people feel safe and maybe, and totally neglect the females in the sample, right? So this is the way you say, there's a, if there's a minority or a smaller group and you want them to get represented, you separate them into uh, the stratum, okay, various strata, and you sample from each one. And that way you make sure every group gets sampled. Make sense? Okay. Going back to the schools, a sad statistics that we see is that um, if I was wanting to sample the school on something about, I don't know, being able to go out to lunch, right? Might the opinion differ between freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors? Yeah. You don't get a car until you're probably a junior, right? So the freshman, sophomore is like, I could care less, right? But most high schools have mostly freshmen. You have like, the, the school that I went to, we think we had like 2,200 students, and I'm not going to get numbers that add up to 2,200. But I had something like, I, I actually had to, one semester I was working for a teacher, and I had to type in all the, the codes for like every student, the entire campus. Like, this is going to take forever. And I went through the freshmen, 
and there was about 700 names. It's like, okay. And then I went through the sophomores, and there was about 500 names. And I went through the juniors, and there was about 400 names. And I went through the seniors, and I was like, this is sad, right? Where do those people go? But the idea is, if I'm wanting to make sure that seniors are not underrepresented, I would separate them into some characteristic, and I would set, I'd be stratified. Make sense? Okay. So we avoid undercoverage. We don't want to leave out some group that may differ. Uh, response bias. People lie. This is actually a bias that's in the response. I'm going to pass out a paper in a few minutes. I want you to write down your name and circle yes or no. Have you ever cheated in a math class? You're all going to be honest, right? There, you don't feel secure. You're not going to answer that, right? The police officer walks in. I'd like to figure how. I'd just like to poll how many of you have done drugs. You raise your hand, right? The guy knocks on your door, right? And the the 13 year girl opens up, and it's like, are your parents home? Yes, yes, they are, right? They they're not they're not available right now, but they're here. You know, <laughs> you you generally lie, and not just to screw people over, but you feel unsafe. Does that make sense? So we do our best when I poll to, you know, a lot of times we, we don't have to write your names on it. Uh, later on this semester, you're going to get to evaluate me. They're going to have you fill out a form, right? I get a lot of that information back. I appreciate that. Hopefully there's good things to say. Um, but you, you don't have to put your name on it, right? You have that safety. I'm not going to come after you. Okay. Um, Non-response bias. People choose not to respond. Do we care about their opinion? I do this all the time. I get a phone call. You know, we'd like to ask you about your, you know, political feelings on the president right now. No. I'm having dinner with my family. I have no interest in spending 30 minutes talking politics with you. I click, right? They're trying to poll and find out how people feel and how people are going to vote, right? I don't respond. So when they publish that and they put it out, does it represent everyone? It doesn't. And that's why people end up getting elected sometimes that we don't think will. Crazy, right? Some people don't choose to respond. Here's another. Ooh, that was touchy. Um, <laughs> wow. Voluntary. That's our last one. Voluntary is where people choose to respond and, and specifically when you give people a choice, right, the people that tend to respond are the ones that feel really strongly or passionately about something, right? They're like, oh my gosh, you, you're calling, you want to talk to me about politics? Let me tell you how I feel, right? So the idea is that um, people choose to respond. They uh, tend to feel strongly about the subject. And normally, they feel negatively. Generally. That's what we tend to have. Does that make sense? So does that create bias? Yeah, because then you come out and you go, wow, you know, um, I think I, I heard an example about this where they were talking about, you know, abortion. There's, top, there's a touchy subject. And all these people are writing in and all these people are calling in and they're like, wow, these people, there's like a huge majority of people that are against this, right? And then it comes time to vote and all these other people come and vote and they weren't feeling strongly to share their opinion, but they still vote. And so it doesn't go the way they expected it to, right? So the idea is just these are all biases and we do our best to control these since we're doing experiments, but these are all things we watch for. Does that make sense? 